Pluto was discovered in 1930 and until 2006 was considered the full-fledged ninth planet of the solar system. After 76 years, the honorable status of Pluto was taken away. However, recent discoveries related to the dwarf planet are increasingly pushing scientists to demand a revision of its status back. In the next couple of minutes, after you subscribe to the channel and like it, we'll tell you the top three reasons to give Pluto back its status as a planet. But first, let's find out why Pluto lost its status as a planet. When Clyde Tombaugh spotted a planet in 1930, the existence of which had been theoretically predicted by Percival Lowell 15 years earlier, astronomy was challenging work. There were no space telescopes, flights to Mars, or photos of black holes. The telescopes were primitive by modern standards, and Tombaugh was looking for Pluto with the help of a blink corporator, switching plates with very low-quality photographs. The standard requirements for an object that could be called a planet were low, so the whole world celebrated a new object, which they planned to call Zeus, Minerva, Kronos, or Pluto. The Greek god of the underworld won the vote, which is symbolic because further research has confirmed that Pluto is extremely cold and dark. Suspicions that it is not a full-fledged planet began almost immediately, because the existence of Pluto was theoretically predicted based on inconsistencies in the orbit of Uranus. However, when scientists calculated the new planet's mass, it turned out that Pluto was not nearly so large as to influence the neighbor's orbit. The mass of the baby planet is 0.2% the mass of the Earth. This is six times smaller than the Moon. In 1978, things got even worse when Charon was discovered. Pluto's satellite turned out to be only eight times lighter, and it turned out that it was not Charon that revolved around Pluto, but both celestial bodies revolved around a common point of mass. At the same time, fans of Jupiter's satellite Ganymede reminded us that it is actually larger than Mercury and our moon, according to this logic, should also be a planet. The discovery of Eris in 2005 brought the situation to a boiling point another dwarf planet, which also turned out to be heavier than Pluto. The community was faced with whether to accept Eris as a planet and risk increasing the list of planets, including everything in a row, or to exclude Pluto and formulate sane parameters. In 2006, we chose the second option, having outlined a few conditions for the status of a full-fledged planet. First, the object must revolve around the Sun. This is logical and the rule excluded the Moon and all the satellites of other planets. Pluto falls under the criteria. It, like Triton, revolves around the Sun. The second criterion is to have enough mass to be spherical. Even the Moon has no issues with this, and Pluto is also round. The stumbling block was the last rule. According to it, the candidate for the title of planet must clear the vicinity of his orbit. That is, to be heavy enough to dominate, turning everything around into satellites. And here, Pluto lost. As we have already mentioned, with the satellite Charon, the planet revolves around a common center of mass, and therefore the orbit is not cleared. As a result, all trans-Neptunian objects like Pluto and Eris, which have the same problems, have received the status of dwarf planets. It is important to understand that the decision is logical. You cannot devalue the status of the planet. Considering it a small object, there is a risk of updating the list every year and getting confused about the number of planets in the solar system. The decision of 2006 was correct, and speaking about the reasons why Pluto needs to have the status of planet returned, we will not dispute it. We will only focus on the fact that since 2006, astronomy has progressed, and we have learned a lot about Pluto. The atmosphere is the first reason it can have the status of a full-fledged planet returned. Pluto is so far away that the sun from it will look 39 times smaller than on Earth, more precisely, we're talking about a figure of less than one arc minute. The human eye cannot distinguish such small objects and represents them as a dot. This is the case with most stars and planets in the night sky. From Pluto, the dot will be very bright, 250 to 320 times brighter than the full moon in the Earth's sky. But this does not change the fact that the heat on Pluto is about the same as in your ex's heart. Logically, the planet should be an empty, lifeless rock. Now imagine the faces of NASA researchers when the New Horizons probe sent a photo of a sunset on Pluto in 2015. It illuminated 20 layers of the atmosphere that rises 1,600 kilometers above the planet. It is higher than on our Earth. It is important to understand that Pluto is not a gas or even an ice giant. 
There is a lot of ice there, but 70% of it is the same rocky world as our Earth, only much smaller. The atmosphere is not what you would expect to find in a celestial body so far from the Sun. Pluto is the only trans-Neptunian object known to science that has an atmosphere. In Eris, under the same conditions, it either appears or disappears. It's not a bad bid to regain the status of the planet, isn't it? Well, apart from the jokes, the atmosphere of Pluto is 100,000 times weaker than the Earth's. It consists mainly of nitrogen and, apart from a beautiful blue haze, does not inspire any hope. However, its presence in a relatively stable form sets Pluto apart from other candidates. And most importantly, somehow, Pluto is constantly replenishing the atmosphere with fresh nitrogen. The New Horizon team's calculations show that the dwarf planet's atmosphere is leaking into space at several tons per hour. However, for some reason, Pluto replenishes its nitrogen reserves and has not entirely lost its atmosphere. Consequently, some processes are going on inside that we have yet to learn about. The second reason to return Pluto to the status of a planet is geological activity. We will return to how distant and cold the world is. Logically, it's worth waiting for a surface similar to the Moon, dead, lifeless, and cratered. This is what Eris and Ceres look like, a typical landscape of a dwarf planet. But Pluto is very different. The photo that the New Horizons probe sent to Earth changed our understanding of the planet forever. Pluto has many mountain ranges, canyons, and all traces of geological activity. Some ice mountains reach the height of 3.5 kilometers. Therefore, Pluto was still geologically active at least 100 million years ago. This is breathtaking because even Mars, which has calmed down a long time ago, cannot boast of such. Meanwhile, a dwarf planet on the solar system's outskirts is having earthquakes and mountain formations. The important thing here is that such processes require energy, a lot of energy. On Earth, the shifting of lithospheric plates is provided by internal processes of a very hot core and mantle. But what makes the surface move, break, and form mountains on Pluto? That's a mystery we have yet to solve. The Sun is too far away to trigger such processes, and there are no planets nearby that can break Pluto by gravity. And so far, all indications are that the tiny planet is alive, changing its surface on its own. Isn't that a sign of a full-fledged planet? Data from the New Horizons probe, among other things, indicate the possibility of the existence of a liquid ocean on Pluto under a crust of frozen nitrogen and a rocky surface. Only they can explain the presence of some tears and cracks on the surface. Some scientists believe that the planet's geological activity is a consequence of the fact that depending on the season, the ocean below the surface either freezes or becomes liquid again. Just like a bottle of water in a freezer, a similar process tears the planet. Even the presence of cryovolcanoes is not ruled out, which throws water and ice to the surface. This is a very active and interesting world that lives according to unique laws. Some aspects of Pluto's geology are not repeated anywhere else in the solar system. What, if not uniqueness, can be considered the primary criterion for a full-fledged planet? Now let's talk about the third reason for the rise of Pluto. It is related to the third paragraph of the rules, which took away the status of a planet from the object. Allegedly, the companion Charon has too much influence on Pluto, and it is not a full-fledged satellite. The two objects rotate around the center of mass, and consequently, Pluto cannot be considered a planet. If the rotation around the Sun and the spherical shape as criteria for a planet fit into the logic and scientific facts, then there are questions with the principle of orbital clearing. They were voiced by Philip Metzger of the University of Central Florida. The scientist holds the title of Pluto's unofficial lawyer and has long been demanding that it be returned to the title of the ninth planet. In addition to the reasons we previously mentioned, they are also legal. Metzger studied all scientific publications for 200 years and didn't find a single scientific confirmation of the existence of such criterion as orbital clearance. It would be used only once, in 1802, and even then, based on arguments later found to be wrong. The fact that Charon affects Pluto should in no way affect whether a space object is a planet or not, only because there are double stars and even black holes in space, and we don't call them dwarf stars or dwarf black holes. On the contrary, it is now believed that single stars, like the Sun, are the exception rather than the rule. Most of the stars we have found are double or even triple. So what's the problem with Pluto being a double planet? The Commission's decision in 2006 looks far-fetched, to say the least, to deprive all small planets of a chance. 
The gravitational influence of Charon on Pluto looks stupid from a scientific point of view. Jupiter also affects the Sun, and the center of mass in the Jupiter-Sun pair is outside the star. And what should we do now? Should we exclude the Sun from our list of stars because Jupiter influences it? Of course not. We can understand the scientists who call Pluto a dwarf planet. They need some kind of solution. But isn't Pluto's complex atmospheric structure and geological activity indicative of a full-fledged planet? Or even a double planet if we consider Charon? We have no problem with giant planets like Jupiter, and for some reason, we can't accept little ones like Pluto, even though they try their best to stand out. So does Pluto deserve to be called a full-fledged planet? Let us know in the comments. That's it for now. See you again, friends.